Hey ladies, it is Miss Monday with your host, Pastor Virginia, and I'm so, so happy that you're with me. You know, yesterday was Easter, and it was so amazing. You know, I'm sure it was great for you, rather you celebrated with your family, um, doing some sort of Easter egg hunt or gathering, or if you stayed home and cozy inside, if you went to church, if you didn't go to church, Everybody's situation was probably different, but I'm gonna say one thing was the same, and that's that Jesus is alive. And so we can all have that one thing in common is that we celebrated the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, uh, and in the, the sacrifice that he made for us. It was such a great day. So I hope that your Easter weekend was blessed. And today we are gonna be talking about um, I've kind of titled this, like, I think it could have like 10 titles, but Monday recommendations, it's about the easiest thing. Uh, we'll get into it. It is going to kind of go a few different directions, so just keep with me here. As you see, I have um, some little sidekicks with me, and I'll tell you about those in just a little while. So I want to I want to read to you Romans 12, 1. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So we talked yesterday, um, I'm sure everyone, a bit about Jesus' sacrifice. And so we were paid with a high price, the price of Jesus' life that we celebrated yesterday, his death, burial, and resurrection. And it says that we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Do you know as Christians were to be like Christ? Well, he offered his body as a living sacrifice for us. And so I want to talk to you a bit about priorities because if this scripture is telling us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, well, what does that mean? And how do we make sure that we're doing that? And so I kind of want to break it down for you ladies today and make it a little easy. So let's talk about priorities. What are biblical priorities? Biblical priorities is God, spouse, children, then your career, your job, your hobby, your whatever, right? So God, spouse, children, than yourself, basically, okay? So let's talk about God first. I have labeled this servanthood. You know, Christ came to serve. It says so in Matthew 20, 28. It says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So uh, servanthood, as a Christian, our relationship with the Lord, it's how are we serving? How are we serving God? How are we serving others? Okay, so just keep this, these priorities in the back of your mind. Now marriage. Marriage, we're called to honor one another, right? It, even in marriage, it talks about our bodies, not our own. You're never to deny your spouse. So you can see how it all correlates together. So our body's not our own. Our life is not our own. We were paid with a price. So it looks as though that God does indeed have this amazing plan for your life and we're to just follow in line, right? And so the next comes parenting. And in parenting, an amazing lesson that I learned about parenting is that, first of all, it says every good and perfect gift comes down from above. So God has given us these children um, to take care of, to raise. It says, raise them up in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from me. So our job is to be Jesus's advocate. We are the advocate for Jesus in the lives of our children. So our job is to teach them the right way to live, to mold them and shape them so that they can carry out the destiny that God has for them. And so when you take all of those priorities into account, you kind of can get overwhelmed and it can kind of be like, whoa, how can I do all this and how can I, uh, how can I still do what I want and be happy? Well, I think that whenever you get the realization that you were bought with the price and your life gains some serious purpose when you understand that because you realize it's more than just what you're wearing, what you're doing, what you have, where you go. Your life means something. It's weighty. There's a reason that you're here. And so when we can operate like that in all the priorities of our lives, I'm telling you, it is like the best joy you'll ever experience. And so 
let's break it down to where it's a little bit more attainable. You know, I'm a firm believer that the amount of corrective criticism that you can handle determines the level of growth that will take place in your life. So I always love self-evaluation or self-reflection. You know, I think deep down we all really want to be better tomorrow than we are today. And it's because that we were created in the image and likeness of our creator, of God, who is perfect in all of his ways. And the word of God tells us that we should be striving for perfection. And it also gives us a way to achieve that perfection, an avenue to attain that through Jesus. And so it's easy to get into a place where you can be like, um, condemning yourself and being, you know, really hard on yourself and down on yourself. And, you know, there's no, now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So in, instead, what we realize is that we take those thoughts captive. As soon as we start self-evaluating and we see these areas we need to change, instead of feeling bad about ourselves, like, oh, I really suck. I, I really, I'm just this horrible person. I'm just angry all the time and I'm just nasty and I'm just no good wife and I'm no good mom and I'm no good friend. Instead of doing all that, the Word of God tells us what to do with those type of thoughts and where to take them captive. You take every thought captive that's contrary to the Word of God, you submit it to the Word of God, and then you can move on. And so it really comes down to changing our mindset. So we take those thoughts captive and then we change our mindset. So instead of being hard um, on myself when I, I realize when the Holy Spirit shows me an area I need to work on, instead I imagine the blood of Jesus seriously like and fully washing away all my imperfections and all my shortcomings every time I self-evaluate. Every time something's brought up that I need to address or correct or change. I just imagine, you know what? It, it's First of all, I am, I'm imperfect. I'm as dirty rags. That's how the Bible describes us. Like we're nothing without Jesus. We can accomplish nothing without Jesus. It is literally through him that we can achieve any great success. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So we have to realize it's on him. It's not on us. So I just imagine the perfectness of Jesus just taking all my imperfectness away every time I see an area I need to change. So now let's get down to the nitty gritty. Um, let's open up our hearts to some areas that we need to change. Like the Holy Spirit, I believe right now is gonna be revealing some areas to you that you need to change. And I wanna give you some amazing ways to be able to handle that corrective criticism when it comes from different avenues, whether it's from the Holy Spirit or when you're reading the Bible or whatever it is. And then that way you can use it to create positive change in your life rather than being that stereotypical woman who is down on herself, an emotional roller coaster all the time and thinks that she sucks in every area. No, you were created to be a strong, amazing woman of God. And so the question is that I want you to ask yourself, what are you feeding yourself? What topics are most of your books about? Okay, what topics are most of your books about? When are you reading those books? Um, what is the topic that you Google search the most? What, um, what are your magazines about? What are you reading about? What articles are you reading about? What podcasts are you listening to? What are you feeding yourself? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And treasure is, is our things, money, our, our possessions, uh, what we consume. That's our treasure, right? So where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what are you feeding yourself? What are your treasures? So we, um, we have to think about what we're giving all of our time to. And if we evaluate ourselves to Romans 12, 1 that I read to you in the very beginning where, you know, it says that our life is not our, our own and that we're to give our life as a living sacrifice, it really looks like that we don't get to just do whatever we want, that our life really was paid with such a high price. And so we need to ask ourselves what we're doing. What are we doing with that? Now, when you evaluate, I always say self-evaluate, when you evaluate something, there's always a standard to measure up to when you're evaluating something. And our standard we know as Christians is Christ. That's our standard. And it's not another wife, it's not another mom, it's not another lady in ministry or artist or whatever you're into. 
it's simply Jesus. So maybe we need to read a little less Vogue magazine. Maybe we need to scroll a little less on that stunning Instagram account of this mom who seems to just have it all. Maybe we need to eliminate those things because comparison is poison. Especially when the comparison is not when we're comparing ourselves to Jesus and we're comparing ourselves to everyone else and everything else. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, we can and we should learn and glean off of other people, but those other people need to be strong, anointed believers. And in a moment, I'm going to share with you um, some some uh, recommendations, Monday recommendations, of, of some uh, people that I've really been able to glean from and, and learn from their experiences. So um, when we think back to our priorities, we got God, spouse, and children. Does your life in those areas line up to the Word of God? What does the Bible say about you, about who you should be, about who you are, about what God created you to be? Now, if we're talking here women, the best thing, and I'm sure you've heard this, is Proverbs 31. When you read Proverbs 31, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you, it'll spark things in your heart, and you're like, oh yeah, I, I don't really have that part together. I really am lacking in this area. I really should tweak this or that. So does your Bible, or does your life line up to the Bible? What are some areas that you can tweak in your life so you can become more Christ-like, so you be, can become more like that Proverbs 31 woman, and then just decide to do it? And so always our number one evaluation, our, our standard is Jesus. So the Bible, does our, does our life line up to the Bible? Now, you gotta get yourself some good books. You gotta get yourself some good books. So after you get the book, then you can also glean and learn from other people's um, experiences, mistakes, uh, the research. You can learn from other anointed people and you've got to get into some good, good books because I'm telling you, when you start reading anointed books, the Holy Spirit will use those anointed books to show you areas that you yourself can um, it, it, you know, change and, and correct in your own life. And you know, it makes me always think like people, I always heard growing up wisdom, you, you get from your own personal experience. Wisdom that's not true. The books definitely disagree. Um, you do gain wisdom by your own personal experiences. Absolutely. However, it's how much more wise is it when you can learn from other people's mistakes? And so I think that by reading books and learning from other people so you don't have to make the same mistakes they do is more wise. Like to me, that's more wise than being stubborn because that's how I was most of my life. I'll just learn on my own. I know it's the hard way, but I'll just figure it out myself. That's kind of stupid. So let's just not do that. Let's just read some really good books, okay? And, and do what they say, all right? So it's a really great way um, to keep yourself, you know, iron sharpens iron. The Bible says literally iron sharpens iron. So if you connect yourself with good godly people, good godly books, and you're reading the word of God, you should really be good to go. Now, another thing that you can do, my, my final thing, is that if you are daily praying this prayer, like, Holy Spirit, reveal to me any area in my life that I need to change, that I need to line up to, things that I, maybe it's just seasons. Maybe I shouldn't be giving my all my time to this right now, and I really should be focusing on this because that's where you want me to be. Um, are there friendships I shouldn't have? Are there things I shouldn't be doing, uh, things I shouldn't be watching? What Whatever it is, if every day you're praying, Lord, what area needs to be changed so that I can be in your perfect will, it keeps ourselves in a position to be humbly willing to learn and grow and change and be directed by the Holy Spirit. When we make our minds up about what we're going to do every day, what we're going to have, where we're going to go, what we've tied God's hands. He, he can't direct us when we're already running and it's impossible. You're not open to the Holy Spirit. So we have to be yielded to the Holy Spirit so we can move when he says move. And we're not so stuck in what our mind says we should be doing right now. So we have to always have an open heart. So every single day when you wake up, pray that prayer. Of, Lord, what is it you have for me to do today? And I'm going to do that. What is it you don't want me to do today? And I'm going to eliminate that. And you just keep yourself in a constant state of being teachable. And that, my friends, God can truly, truly do wonders with. So keep yourself teachable. Now, 
a lot of times people hate the word criticism and I used to be one of those people, but I had to just change my mindset. Today's thing's all about your mindset. So I had to change my mindset. Instead of thinking corrective criticism, because even when you say corrective criticism, it can still be negative. Think about it instead as inspiration. You hear people all the time like, this book inspired me, or I read this scripture and it inspired me, or I, you know, I was hanging around this person and she inspired me. She inspired me to be better. She inspired me to do this artwork. She inspired me, blah, blah, blah. You can get inspired. So think about corrective criticism as just inspiration. Inspiration to be better. And so I wanna share with you um, some books. Now, these are just literally three amazing books that I just pulled from my bookshelf. There are so many more, and I'm sure I'll do another one of these where I can talk to you a little bit more in depth about all these other books that truly have changed my life. But I want to share with you these three um, because these books inspired me to become a better person, to change who I was, to become more Christ-like, to be a better mom, to be a better wife, to be a better friend, just to be a better me all the way around. And so I want to share those with you because today's Monday recommendations and so I'm going to recommend some amazing books to you that inspired me so if the word corrective criticism freaks you out don't think about it like that and don't say corrective criticism just say inspiration inspiration will do okay so we need to be in a constant state of being on the outlook for inspiration and avenues um, to change and to grow and then just make that very simple decision to change. When the Holy Spirit reveals an area that needs to change, let's just let's just do it. Let's just change. So, get rid of this bowl. Dear Antler, now before I get into these three books, I want to share with you the very first book that was an anointed book that changed my life. I don't have it. It's down in my basement and with a million other books that we have and I can't get to it. I tried to find it. So I apologize, but it is um called Crazy Love, Crazy Love. And it is Chan is his last name. It's Chan, something Chan. Let me see if I can find it. Um, give me one second, sorry. Because I could just show you here, Crazy Love. I could show you what the book looks like here from my iPad. So let's go to images. And here it is. And it is by Francis Chan. I knew it was Chan. I knew it was something Chan. And it looks like on Amazon, you can get this book for uh, like $13, $10, you can get it for 10 bucks. So crazy love. Now I want to let you know, so that's what, oh, you can see the reflection of the recording thing. I'm so sorry. Let's see if we can, oh, here we go. Here we go. So Crazy Love by Francis Chan. And it says, overwhelmed by a relentless God. And I needed that book when I first rededicated my life to the Lord. This book truly showed me God's heart, God's heart for me. I fell in love with Jesus. Crazy love. When you, the thing is, is you can't love until you actually receive love first. And I never growing up, and not that my parents didn't love me, they showered me with love, but I had some issues inside of me that kept me from really receiving the love. They dished it out. They showered me with it, but I wasn't receiving it. And it's because you have to receive the perfect love first before you can receive human love. And I had never been able to be successful doing that. That book helped me see God, truly see God. And when you get to receive God's love, I'm telling you, it's a game changer. So crazy love, number one recommendation across the board. So we want to go with our priorities. First is God, then is marriage, and then is children. So crazy love. Then Pastor uh, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown, our pastor, okay, from the Bible school that Tim and I went to, we met there, the river at Tampa Bay, our, um, um, the River Bible Institute, which is now RU, so River University, but all the same thing. Uh, he is the author of this book, The Anointing, and this book truly is anointed. I don't even know what else to say. It like just takes you to a whole nother level. Crazy Love and The Anointing are two huge recommendations that if you want to grow your relationship deeper with the Lord and to see Him clear, then those two books are for you, okay? 
The next one, we're gonna talk about marriage. And there's two books, I don't have the other one with me. I might be able to do the same thing. Let me find it on my iPad. Um, let's see. This is more, um, a little less uh, regimented than my usual teaching, so you can just bear with me. Um, but, The Covenant Marriage. Oh my gosh, this book so amazing. Covenant Marriage by Gary Chapman. And so my parents were divorced. If you know my if you know my um my testimony, I've been married and divorced before Tim twice. That's a whole nother thing. We'll get there. The Lord has redeemed me beyond redemption. Um, I'm so grateful for the Lord and what he's done in my life. I'm literally like a totally different person. But because of my past, I had no realization of what marriage actually was. I just had this really skewed vision of it and, and I had no clue. You know, you always hear like marriage is a covenant, not a contract. But for me, it was just a contract that could be broken. And that's not biblical at all. So, The Covenant Marriage. Covenant Marriage by Gary Chapman. I'm telling you, this breaks down what a biblical marriage should be and should look like. He doesn't, he doesn't miss a detail. And so that book will truly show you what God's intention was for marriage. And then, One Flesh. One Flesh by Bob um, Yandy, Yan, um, Yan Dian, um, Bob, bye Bob, bye Bob. And my friends, I'm here to tell you this book again, uh, you gotta have it. If you're married, wanting to get married, one flesh. You know, the Bible says that they became one. What does that mean? I mean, you're two different people. How in the world can you be one? This tells you. So gotta have it. Now, Moving on to parenting, last book, and then I'll let you guys go on this lovely Monday, this lovely rainy Monday where it's so cozy and you just wanna like get in bed and take a nap, which is what I'm gonna do right after this. Parenting, let's talk about parenting. Paul David Tripp has written this book called 14 Gospel Principles to Parenting. And I'm telling you, there's so many things out there about parenting, it is so hard to know which way is up. And, and you know, Look, we are a child of God. Like that's what his expertise is on is, is being a parent, right? Like God, we're all God's children. So he's like the best parent. So why in the world would we try to do any parenting outside of biblical parenting? And so I love these 14 gospel principles to parenting. And it has literally helped me so much just gauge everything when it comes to parenting. I gauge everything. All, obviously we go back to priorities. So everything comes back to the standard of Jesus, the standard of the word of God. And this book is so simple to understand. He has given so many of his experiences, his shortcomings, things he messed up with his kids on, he and his wife, things they wish they would have done differently. And the hard lessons that he had to go through with his children um, to bring them back to the simple gospel. And it's amazing. So if you're out there, you wanna be a mom, you're pregnant right now, you're planning your family, I would say this book is an absolute must. I like want to get it for every person that I find out's pregnant. I like ship them this book because it is that good. So that's the one for parenting. And I'll give you some more recommendations another time. And if you have any questions about anything that's uh, maybe different than these three topics, the, you know, your relationship with God or marriage or parenting, ask me. We love books. We love gaining knowledge. You know, the word of God says my people perish due to the lack of knowledge. And again, we all want to be a better person tomorrow than what we are today. And we do that by gaining knowledge and being willing to change once we receive that knowledge. So I love you ladies. I know all you out there are just growing and becoming a stronger woman of God who's anointed to do amazing things for him. So I love you guys. And we'll see you next time.